come before you just to say it's such a blessing to know that you are a strong and mighty tower for us. That no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're dealing with, Lord, we can turn to you and you have us. We are protected by you. And we can depend on that forever, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I hope everyone's doing good today. It's a nice day outside, considering it's January. <laughs> so we're going to talk about here, we're in the story right now, right in the middle of the story. And it's week 14. And it's about a kingdom that's torn in two. And the kingdom we're talking about is Israel. Now, with all good and lasting stories, they're, they're built the same. Stories are told through the hero, typically. The one who lives the story. And the story begins usually in an ordinary world. With the hero doing ordinary things. A place of comfort that the hero must ultimately leave. Stories start with the inciting incident. An event in which there would be no story if it didn't happen. And stories are about deliverance, the journey that frees and redeems the hero and his world. But why is that? Because the purpose of the story is new life. Like Simba, future Lion King, frolicking in the ordinary world of the Pride Lands. Until the inciting incident of his father's death making him a fugitive. But through the call of his father, he is delivered from guilt, from shame. Why? So that everything can be different. So that scar can be defeated, that pride lands can flourish, and the circle of life can, well, keep circling. <laughs> Darling Dorothy, running away to save her dog when the exciting incident of the twister drops her in the land of Oz. But finally, the guidance of the good witch delivers her from separation, from loss. But why? So that everything can be different. So that she can learn the love of her family. The value of home, and even little Toto can be saved. The purpose of the story is new life. Why is that? Well, who made the story? And what kind of story is he trying to tell? The story, faithful Naomi in a pagan land when, her, when the death of her husband makes her a widow. But through the love her, of her daughter-in-law, she is delivered from loneliness. And loving Ruth, a widow herself, supporting Naomi by scavenging the fields when the kindness of Boaz delivers her from poverty. But why? So that everything could be different. So that Naomi could be cared for and Ruth could have children and the family line of Jesus could march on. And if you, if God finds you in an ordinary world of like a partying student or a busy housewife or a comfy retiree, if God barges in with an inciting incident of an invitation accepted, a tumor discovered or a broken marriage, if God redeems you through deliverance from sin, from, ju from judgment, from death, why? So that everything could be different. Amen, amen. So that your mind and your heart, your marriage, your family, your job, and your kids could all be made new. That's the purpose of every good story. Amen. That's the purpose of God's work in you. That's new life in Christ. But it doesn't happen so easy like that always, does it? Not in the movies, not in your life, and not in the Bible. Saul was chosen by God, crowned by Samuel as Israel's king, divided the nation, disobeyed God, became a paranoid mess. So God sent David to take the crown. And then David, virtuous warrior, a man after God's own heart, becomes a peeping Tom, steals a wife, kills a husband, and so God sends Nathan to wake him up. You ever read a story like that? Where the hero desperately needs someone to come and give them a helping hand, a word of advice, a kick in the pants? 
Simba had his father. Dorothy had the good witch. Marlin had Dory. <laughs> Neo had Morpheus. Bilbo had Gandalf. Luke, well, he needed Obi-Wan and Yoda. <laughs> but why? Because the writers of all good stories instinctively know that the hero isn't strong enough or brave enough or virtuous enough to save themselves. And how do they know this? Because it's the state that we are all in. Because the author of our story isn't finished writing. Because over and over again, we stand tall, or when we fall flat, or when we beg for help, God responds. Amen. And even when our story seems at an end, he steps in and turns the page and writes something new. In 1 Kings 11, 9 and 11, it reads, The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. See, at the time, Solomon was king. He had done well through most of his life as king in his reign, but at the end, he was disobeying God in several ways. And God responded, and his response was to split the kingdom in two. Now, the vision is a good word to describe our culture these days. It wasn't just limited to 930 B.C. in Israel. We see in America in 2019, there's a lot of political division. There's conflict in the workplace. There's dissension in homes and splits, even within churches. But God's will is for us to live in harmony and peace. That's right. To live without tension and alienation, without dissension and division. In Psalm 133, 1, it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 18, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Amen. Here in chapter 14 of the story, we see the vision. We see the kingdom that has been torn in two. And this chapter covers 1 Kings 12 through 1 Kings 16. And during this time, during the time of David and Solomon, the nation of Israel was at its zenith, at its peak. Things were kicking along. It was really good. Those are the glory years, the golden era of Israel. But then everything spiraled into chaos. And today we're going to learn about what went wrong so that we can avoid making those same mistakes in our homes, in our individual lives, at work, or even in this church. We are going to see some of the pitfalls that we must avoid. After Solomon died, the nation of Israel, Israel was divided. The ten tribes that were in the north aligned themselves behind a man named Jeroboam. And that became known as Israel. At the same time, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin down in the south were loyal to the leader, Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon. That area became known as, known as Judah. Then back in 1 Kings 11, God had picked Jeroboam to be the next king. This didn't sit well with Solomon, since Jeroboam wasn't one of his sons, but instead was someone that was on his staff. So Solomon responded by trying to kill Jeroboam. So Jeroboam fled to Egypt till Solomon passed away. In 1 Kings 11.43, Then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. So see, the problem we have here, we already have two kings. We have the king that God anointed, and we have the king that man appointed. As a pastor of a, a church, Crossroads Christian Church in Grand Prairie, Texas, his name is Barry Cameron, he says, anything with two heads belongs in a sideshow. And, matter, and matters are going to get worse and worse by having two kings as we go forward. But we're going to learn three important lessons. And here's the first lesson I want you to see. The past can bring division or unity in the future. It will do one or the other. So the kingdom of Israel was split. But why? What happened in the past? 
The massive division is coming to the entire nation of Israel, and the reason for it is the failed legacy of an unfaithful leader named Solomon. See, during Solomon's reign, he was very aggressive. He accumulated incredible amounts of wealth the old-fashioned way. He did it by raising the taxes. He also had the hardest labor expectations for his citizens. He got very aggressive with the building projects, purchasing ships, amassing personal assets that were very expensive. And to fund it all, he overtaxed the people of Israel and put an overwhelming burden upon them. The decision we make today and the way we live our lives will affect generations to come in either a positive or negative way. That's true at home, it's a, true at work, and it's true in your relationships. Think of it this way. Our present, present decisions will affect future generations. They will lead to either blessings or hardships. It all comes back to the choices that you make. My family, family and I moved here in 1989, a long time ago. I remember it clearly because that summer was the year Batman came out, and me and my friend Ken Hearn went and watched Batman before we left. It was it's one of my favorite memories. Then we had our first service in North Lakes here in, in the spring of 1990. But what some of you don't know, some of you already know, but some of you don't know, was Minnesota wasn't the first choice. Columbus, Ohio, as well as Providence, Rhode Island, were both on the short list, along with Minnesota. Minnesota wasn't even on the top of that list at first. There's something about snow. Well. <laughs> And actually, things seemed leading towards Providence to be the final decision for planting this new church. But at the last moment, the Holy Spirit put it on both Ed and Barbara's hearts that Minnesota is where we should go. There was a lot of human factors that made the decision the right decision, but the Holy Spirit factor made it the perfect decision. Amen. And it is that decision, nearly 30 years ago, that affects what's happening here today. The kingdom mindset in the past put us on the pathway for unity in the future. But don't just think of it collect in the collectivity sense, I don't know from a sense, from a church world. Think of it from a personal sense, from your individual lives, and see the impact of your life and your actions and what they can, the effect they can have on generations to come. Do you want your children to be thanking God for the legacy that you passed on to them? Some of you are saying, well, you have no idea what my life is like. It's in shambles. I've made such a mess of my life. And maybe you have. But God specializes in allowing you, along with him, to transform your story. Amen. God loves to write a new ending that you're not expecting. It all begins with your willingness to say, I, will I am willing to change. I am willing to make wise and right choices. This leads us to our second lesson. Counsel can hinder or help to build unity. The advice that you are given can either help or hurt the cause of unity. When Rehoboam, down in the southern section, sought to counsel the elders about whether to continue the hard policies of his father's way of taxing the people, he asked them, what do you think I should do? And he said, and they said to him, you know what? Your dad was so tough on the people, you had to give them a break. They are due a break. After all these years of hardships they went through, Rehoboam listened to their counsel, and then he turned and went to his young cronies, and he asked them their opinion. Their opinion was just the opposite. In verse 8 and 9 of 1 Kings 12, it says, But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders, rejected the advice the elders gave him, and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, What is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, Lighten the yoke of your father put on us? Rehoboam followed the counsel of the younger men who told him, No, no, no. Don't back off. Now this is the time to step on the gas. Now is the time to really grind these people down and show them who's boss, that you're king. And that's exactly what Rehoboam did. Rehoboam said to the people, you think it was bad before with my father? I expect even more from you. It's going to be like there's a scorpion in your midst. The result of when he gave them, gave them that speech was the northern tribes separating instantly from the south, southern tribes. They withdrew. Israel was totally fractured. 
In other words, the whole nation was divided because Rehoboam listened to bad advice. God's good counsel begins with seeing what the Bible has to say. It's followed by praying to God and asking him for his wisdom, and then followed up by talking to godly people that you respect, who know you, who know your situation, and seeking godly counsel. But it doesn't end there. Too often that's where we stop. The key then is to follow through on that advice. So many times we'll pray, we'll read God's word, and we'll seek godly advice, we get it, and then we say, hmm, nah, I don't think I want to do that. That doesn't sound fun. Or I don't have time for that. And we do our own thing. And that's where we fall short. The Bible tells us several times in this section that there was a continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Listening to ungodly counsel can cause tension to escalate. This is why I will always recommend people go into Christian counseling so that you will hear from a person who has a Christian perspective and the worldview. If you're a Christian, that's who you should seek. The church should be the leading the way in this. The church should be setting the example in this. In Titus, it talks about a disciple making model for us. It talks about the older men should be pouring into the younger men. The older women should be pouring into the younger women and guiding their steps. Titus 2, 7, 3, 8 follows that and says, In everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. The former pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, Bob Russell, said, The church needs the vision and vitality of youth to be balanced with the wisdom and experience of age. Amen. That's the right balance. Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but when with many advisors, they succeed. There's a third lesson. A solid faith in truth creates unity. A solid faith in truth creates unity. For peace to prevail, you must choose the right God. You must move in the right direction in God-honoring fashion. It wasn't just Rehoboam that got bad advice. Jeroboam got bad advice too. In 1 Kings 12, 26, 30, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David if these people go up to offer their sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They will again give their allegiance to the Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. Ah, they're very smart. He said to the people, Is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel, and the other he set up in Dan. And this thing became sin, became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. You see what's happening here? Jeroboam doesn't want the people to make their pilgrim, pilgrimage back to Jerusalem. You know why? He's afraid. He's afraid if they go down there to worship, they will be close to, too close to Rehoboam. Who is in the line of David? Whom God has said is where the royal line will always remain. And if they come down to the temple in Jerusalem, then they might move their allegiance to Rehoboam. What in the world is he thinking? He builds two golden calves, not just one. I mean, he has to outdo the his, you know, history there. Doesn't he remember what his ancestors, the Israelites in the wilderness did when they worshiped the golden calf? And how God punished them? Now he puts up two? All this because of his own ego. He sells out the one true God because of his ego. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care. He, he's doing his own thing. He's, he's concerned about his own kingdom and not the kingdom of God. Are you ever like Jeroboam? Are you completely, do you, do you go completely against what God wants for you in your life? Looking out for just number one? I, I know what times I have. And Jeroboam doesn't stop with just idol worship. He goes against God by appointing inappropriate priests. 
God has commanded them to always pick their priests from the tribe of Levi. But Jeroboam chose to do something else. And Jeroboam, his line of reasoning was, we don't have to do everything exactly like God says to do. So God says to him in 1 Kings 14, 8 through 9, You have not been like my servant David, who kept my commands and followed me with, his, with all his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made yourself for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have provoked me to anger and thrust me behind your back. So God is upset with your boy. But Rehoboam wasn't any better. Listen to what he does in 1 Kings 14. God allows Shishak, the king of Egypt, to attack Judah. He ransacks the palace and all the temple treasures and takes everything Solomon had made, including the gold shields, if you remember that from last time. The gold shields were in the temple. Now, this was no big deal to Rehoboam. He thought, eh, no biggie. We'll just make some other shields. We'll make them out of bronze this time. They're just as good as gold ones God had Solomon make before. He didn't want God's blessing. He didn't think he needed God's blessing. He decided to bless himself. He'd do this, he'd do this his own way. Go his own way. He'd be fine. He was a self-made man after all. Besides, his dad Solomon, the wealthiest man to ever walk the earth, He's got this. But, it's never, it, but it never works out when you try to do it our way. Amen. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. You know, our nation could go the very same route as Israel if we too choose the wrong God. Now, the stories of Rehoboam and Jeroboam are sad stories, really. And I, I don't want to leave you with sad, bad news. There was a king that follows Rehoboam, and one of Rehoboam's son, uh, Abijah, I think is how you say it. Abijah was the son of Rehoboam, who only served as a king for three years. But the third king of Judah, he's the grandson, great-grandson of Solomon, grandson of Rehoboam. And his name was Asa. Now, diving into this, I, I got to say, I hadn't, I don't remember reading about Asa until I started getting into this, into this week. It's a very interesting story. Despite of the fact that his father was a sinful man and his mom was a pagan, Asa became one of Judah's most godly kings in the history books because he didn't follow the example of his parents. He didn't listen to the advice of his grandmother. His pagan grandmother, um, Mecca, wife of Rehoboam, had her own Asherah pole right there in her own house. One of the first things Asa did was he cut down that Asherah pole, he burned it, and he deposed his grandmother from her position as queen mother. This is what the Bible says about Asa, the redeeming king in this line of kings. In 1 Kings 15, 11 and 14, Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. Wow. What a statement. Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. Amen. You and I have a choice today. That choice is what kind of legacy do we want to leave behind? If we want to be remembered for the right things, we need to make the right choices. And we've got to do the right things so that when the present becomes the past, the future, future will be better because of the wise decisions we've made today. Amen. That's how you build and pass on a godly legacy. It begins by making the right decisions today. At the end of your life, the people closest to you say that you were a person who loved Jesus and that you wanted everyone to know Jesus. I can guarantee you there will be a rich legacy that comes from that. Right. Do you ever sense that God winks at us? If the leadership and members of this church honor God today, God will bless us in the future. See, God is not uninvolved. God has been with us every step of the way. And he will continue to be. When his people sin, God responds. When his people repent, God responds. 
When he seems distant and he doesn't make sense, give him time. He will respond. And when it seems like the story has come to an end, he steps in and he turns the page and he writes something new. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that our story is not over and that we can be more like you as we step on in our story with you. We ask that you give us the strength to make the right decisions that you want us to make, Lord, and give us the hearing that we can hear your voice tell us the path that we need to take. Lord, we just ask that you bless this congregation as we move forward, as we walk in your, on your path, and help us to know that even if we stumble, that we can just get picked back up by you, Lord, and get right back on the path. In Jesus' name, amen.